Well, indeed, I want to talk tonight about what do creationists believe about human evolution, because I think this is a very interesting way to think about evolution, to think about human evolution, to learn a little bit more about the creationists. And I personally have found the creation and evolution movement absolutely um, challenging, goodness knows, uh, but, but also intellectually very interesting for probably 30 five years now, but who's counting? So I hope I can maybe interest you in, in following this controversy and becoming interested in it as well. Well, what, ex what do creationists believe about human evolution? We probably should talk first a little bit about what creationists believe about evolution in general. And of course, the answer is not much. Um, they're not terribly enthusiastic about evolution. Uh, I want to start, I want to talk a little bit about evolution and then what creationists think about it. I know this is the American Museum of Natural History. I know that this is a much more scientifically sophisticated audience than I am usually uh, honored to speak before. But just so we all have the same ideas in our brain as I'm talking about these uh, uh, topics, um, indulge me for a moment as I suggest that evolution is a three-part idea. There's the big idea of evolution, which is that living things have common ancestors, that living things have descended with modification from common ancestors over time. But we also talk about the mechanisms or processes of evolution, and obviously natural selection is the most important of these. But as important as natural selection is, I mean, natural selection is certainly primary, there are a lot of other factors that influence uh, this descent with modification through time. Natural selection bats last, but there also is a non-selective means, there's evo devo, there's a number of things that, that we are studying to help us understand how evolution takes place. So in addition to the big idea, in addition to the mechanisms of evo evolution, we also have the patterns of evolution. In other words, how has this fabulous tree of life of which human beings are a part branched and split through time as organisms have evolved from that first one or a few um, single-celled organisms? So I'm going to be talking about what creationists think about, evolu about evolution and human evolution in terms of these three ideas. And in general, you'd be surprised to hear that creationists actually do accept most of the mechanisms. That's not the problem. They don't accept the patterns of evolution and they don't accept the big idea of common ancestry, but they're actually okay with natural selection. And I'll try to explain a little bit about why they feel that way. First of all, I want to, to try to explain how all of these, all three of these ideas fit. Let me talk about the creationist worldview itself. Where are these people coming from? Um, certainly, uh, I think it's useful to recognize that there's two kinds of creationists or two kinds of anti-evolutionism in the United States today. The more familiar kind of anti-evolutionism is sometimes called creation science, um, uh, mentioned in, uh, in uh, uh, the introduction. Um, I'll talk a little bit more detail about that. And then there's the new kid on the block, which is intelligent design creationism, which in my opinion is demonstrably a subset of the bigger idea of creation science. Now, of course, the folks up at the Discovery Institute break out in hives when they're called creationists, but they are. Um, the intelligent design movement doesn't make all of the claims that you find in creation science. That's why I consider it a subset. You don't find the intelligent design people, for example, talking about the um, uh, Noah's flood or how old the earth is, uh, which are big issues in creation science. But I will assure you that everything that you would read in the intelligent design literature is not unique. It pre-existed in creation science. And one of the, the real contributions, as um, Eric mentioned, uh, uh, yes, at NCSC we are both an activist organization as well as a scholarly organization. One of the things that we contributed to scholarship as a part of the Kitzmiller versus Dover trial is really digging deep into the NCSC archives and finding out a lot about the history of intelligent design that historically ties it to creation science, but also in terms of content, it is tied very closely. Now, most of my comments tonight about what creationists think about evolution and human evolution are going to be more 
reflective of creation science, but really in terms of the things I'm talking about, the intelligent design people are right next to them in, in almost all cases. So where are the creationists coming from? Well, basically the creationists, whether of the intelligent design or the uh, creation science variety, embrace a theological view known as special creationism. And there we go. No, we don't. We are not going. Hang on. Um, when all else fails, hit the escape key, right? There we go. Okay. Um, one of the major concerns is the inerrancy of the Bible. Um, the Bible is considered to be true in all of its original uh, formats, and not only true, but um, largely literally true. Uh, evolution and other types of science are considered to be less reliable because they're always changing. And of course, we who are in science understand that that's one of the strengths of science, that we can modify our explanations when we get new information in, when we get new ways of looking at information, when we get new instrumentation, new theoretical perspectives. And I think we are getting a much um, more accurate view of what the natural world is like. We don't really consider it a flaw or a weakness of science if our explanations change over time, if our explanations evolve, if you will. But to many conservative Christians, this is considered a weakness of science because they believe that the Bible is the revealed truth, comes directly from God, almost to the King James uh, 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 Version uh, authors, and that it is unchallengeable, it is inerrant. The theology of special creationism is very important, especially in creation science. In special creationism, it's not just that God created, specifically it's how God created. And in special creationism, God creates according to a literal interpretation of Genesis. So God creates everything in its present form. And that's not just human beings and animals and plants. That's the whole universe. So if you look out at galaxies, the billions of galaxies that are out there, you look at the planet Earth, the solar system, and of course animals and plants, all of this was created in its present form. So if you were able to go back into the past, you'd see pretty much the same universe that you see today. Um, creation in, in its present form is something that you find true of both intelligent design as well as creation science proponents. They also believe that living things, animals and plants, were created as kinds of organisms. The Bible says uh, to uh, God creates um, organisms and, and tells them to reproduce after their kind. So kind is a special term of art in creation science and also in the special creationist uh, uh, theology. The kind of modern updated version of the created kinds uh, refers to these entities as having limited genetic variation. And I'll give you some examples of that a little bit later on. So you can't go from one kind to another uh, because there's not enough uh, genetic variation within a created kind for that kind of evolutionary uh, transfer. And usually in the most common form of special creationism, this whole creation event of galaxies and planets and solar systems and plants and animals and people occurred at about the same time, over six days or whatever. Now here's one difference where the intelligent design people vary a little bit from the creation science supporters because the intelligent design proponents are generally followers of another kind of theological view called progressive creationism in which God creates sequentially through time rather than all at once. And of course, conservative Christians argue among themselves as to which is the more biblically appropriate view. Most of the, of the intelligent design people, though, are not fiat or all at once creationists, they are progressive creationists. The most important figure in creation science um, is John Morris, excuse me, Henry Morris, uh, who until his death a year or so ago was the director of the Institute for Creation Research. His son John Morris runs the shop now. Back in 1963, Henry Morris and John Whitcomb, a theologian, wrote the book called The Genesis Flood, which really began the creation science movement. This is considered the founding document of creation science. Now in this book, the idea is presented that, first of all, the Earth is young. It's only about 10,000 years old. 
and that Noah's flood was a real historical event. The whole planet was covered with water to 100 feet above the tallest mountain, just like it says in the Bible, and that all of the plants and animals and people today that we see are descendants of people and creatures that were put on a large boat that survived the literal Noah's flood. And that, of course, is, is fairly standard um, uh, fundamentalist uh, uh, biblical literalism. The distinction in this book was that they made the further claim that all of these really religious views could be supported through the data and theory of science. So this was really the first foray into what began, <clears throat> became known as scientific creationism. And I want to be sure to make that distinction because, of course, there are many, many, many forms of creationism out there if creationism just means God created. Um, Catholics believe God created. Episcopalians believe God created. But they also believe evolution happened. There's <clears throat> excuse me, a number of Christian views about how God created. Special creationism is this particular biblically uh, literalist-oriented view, which will be our, our major concern tonight. Um, now, of course, the idea that there is scientific evidence that supports a 10,000-year-old Earth, much less a flood that covered the whole planet, simply does not exist. Uh, there, there are no data to support these. So what you tend to find if you read the creationist literature is rather than positive um, arguments to support the sudden uh, emergence of plants and animals all at one time, for example, or young Earth, what you tend to find are attacks upon evolution. In creation science, they have what they call the two-model approach, which is that there are only two alternatives. There's either evolution or there's special creationism. So clearly, from a logical standpoint, all you have to do is disprove evolution, and special creationism wins by default. So they don't have to provide a positive model. All they have to do is prove evolution is wrong. And what the creation science literature does, or, or expresses, is people who have gone through the real scientific literature and pulled out little anomalies, and this kind of anomaly mongering is, is very classic in creation science. They, they'll find a little anomaly that, you know, looks a little bit funny if the Earth is more than, uh, if the Earth is really millions or billions of years old, and they hold that forth and say, see, that proves evolution never happened. Therefore, we win. But of course, if you're wrong, that doesn't make me right, and vice versa. Uh, this is not a very logical way of arguing, particularly since over there on the creation side, there are a lot of other alternatives other than special creationism. There is, for example, something called theistic evolution, which if you went to a Catholic school, that's what you were taught. Uh, you were taught evolution happened, but it was God's way of doing it. Now, there's a whole lot of different kinds of theistic evolution. This isn't a theology lecture, although it's an interesting topic. Uh, but there are many, many ways that Christians have considered how God could interact with nature and so forth. But the basic idea that evolution's OK, that evolution happened, it's not a problem, that humans share common ancestry with uh, chimpanzees and so forth, this is not a problem in theistic evolution. Um, but we shouldn't just be Christian-centric, because there are an awful lot of other re religions on the world uh, that um, uh, people adhere to. And disproving evolution doesn't prove them either. And the fact that you have so many other alternatives over here on the uh, special creation side suggests that this is really even more bad logic than it would appear from the immediate view. Nonetheless, um, the creation science movement is really quite active. Not only uh, is the Institute for Creation Research a very active creation science organization, uh, this was founded by um, Henry Morris, of course, the Creation Research Society aspires to be the scholarly arm of the movement. Answers in Genesis, outside of Cincinnati, it was founded by a cadre of Australian and New Zealander fans of the ICR, and Ken Ham, who is the Australian who runs the Answers in Genesis, is planning on the 28th of this month to open a 60,000 square foot multi-million dollar museum of creation science, where the Earth will be presented as uh, being no more than 10,000 years old. Humans and dinosaurs lived together before the flood. 
and all of the other views that we associate with, Christian, with creation science. Uh, creation science evangelism is a third major creationist movement, but uh, this one is uh, not going to be very active for a while. The uh, leader of this group out of Pensacola, Florida, uh, Kent Hovind, um, doesn't um, believe that he needs to uh, file uh, withholding and FICA for his employees, and he was recently made a guest of the uh, government uh, and fined uh, uh, $700,000, and uh, so this is, uh, we probably won't be hearing a whole lot from Dr. Dino, as he is called. Now, the creationist view of reality, uh, of the relationship of living things, which we call systematics in evolutionary biology, um, differs considerably from that of evolution. Creationists view kinds as being separately created, like blades of grass. Uh, you can think of this as the creationist lawn, as it were. Uh, compared to the more tree-like relationship as produced by the branching and splitting of lineages that uh, we and the scientific community interpret the data as uh, supporting evolution. Trees and lawns are very different conceptualizations of systematics. Creationists reject the pattern of evolution as we recognize it in favor of the special creation of separate kinds. Paralleling the importance of special creationism to young earth creationists is the story of the flood of Noah. Of course, the Genesis flood, the founding document of creation science, made a, a, a focused upon um, uh, the um, the flood as as being scientifically demonstrable, but also being the result of catastrophic forces um, rather than gradual forces, and and a lot of this is tied in with the young age of the Earth. And of course, this is a very smart move because without millions of years for evolution to take place, you don't get evolution. Evolution is completely dependent upon an ancient age of the earth, which is why the creation science people attack the age of the earth so strongly. And the Noah's Ark story is essential to this picture. Um, creationists believe that the uh, Grand Canyon, for example, was laid down by the early and, excuse me, by the pre-flood and the early flood, and the rest of the Colorado Plateau was laid down thereafter. By the way, um, National Center for Science Education does have a raft trip through Grand Canyon, uh, as does the Institute for Creation Research, of course, uh, but I should tell you in advance that if you do go down with the Institute for Creation Research on a raft trip through the Grand Canyon, you will only get the creationist point of view. If you come with the National Center for Science Education, we have with us a, a skilled geologist who will present to you the evolution side of things, and I will present to you the creationist side of things, and you can make up your own mind. So we truly give a creation and evolution tour of Grand Canyon. Actually, the um, a uh, geologist uh, who um, uh, goes with us on these trips is a paleontologist from Yale named Alan Gishlick, got his PhD from Yale, and uh, all his life he's been called Gish. So we couldn't help but advertise this as see the canyon with Scott and Gish. And if you know anything about Dwayne Gish, the very famous creationist debater, you can see why that would raise quite a few eyebrows if someone were to come across that. Uh, we just had, a, by the way, we just had a, a cancellation this week for our trip for July 17th to the 24th, so if two people are interested, see me after the program. Uh, we, have, we have two seats to fill on our boat. But uh, the, the the ark story is very important. Now the ark is a very big boat. Okay, the ark is a really, really, really large craft. But if Noah has to take male and female of all the kinds, what is a kind? A kind couldn't be a species because you'd fill up the ark with beetles and bats. I mean, you, the, a kind can't be a species because there's not enough room for all the living things to be on the ark. And remember, God created everything all at one time, including dinosaurs and mammoths and all of the extinct animals uh, that we don't have around anymore. And all of those had to go on the ark too. So what is a kind? And how many kinds of dinosaurs were there? How many kinds of elephants were there? Because you have to take enough food on the ark to feed all of these animals for a whole year. It was the 40 days and 40 nights, that's just the rain. After the 40 days and 40 nights of rain, if you read your Bible, um, the ark bobbed around for almost a full year before it landed. So 
you know, this is the biggest zoo in the, in the world, and Noah and his family have to take care of them. So how many animals were on the ark? I showed you a slide earlier of a book called Noah's Ark, a feasibility study. They really are, are very concerned with this issue of kind. Now, now we're getting to the fun stuff. Determining what a kind is has been a real concern of creation science really since um, the 60s when Henry Morris started things, but even before that, even, even back into the, um, into the 1940s. And since about the 1990 or so, there's been a new um, approach to determining kinds in uh, creation science called baraminology. Now, baraminology comes from the Hebrew bara, to create, and min, meaning kind. So baramin is the created kind, and baraminology is the study to try to determine what a created kind is. This is also called discontinuity systematics. Because, and it's, it's, it's fascinating to think about this, because when you think of what systematics is in evolutionary biology, especially phylogenetic systematics, right? What you're trying to do is show the connections between all the forms of life. Baraminology or discontinuity systematics is trying to show the, the separations. It's trying to show uh, how you can produce a lawn from living things rather than a tree. So the whole orientation is very, very different. They have started using a number of terms that are very similar to those used in phylogenetic uh, systematics. And um, they don't exactly track such things as monophyly, paraphyly, polyphyly, and all that. But it's, it's kind of close, uh, but again, in this non-evolutionary um, uh, uh, sequence. If you want to know more about this, in a recent issue of NCSE Reports, um, Alan Gishlick um, uh, has written a whole paper on baromenology, and I think some of you might find this quite interesting. And if you don't subscribe to the reports of NCSE, let me know and I'll send you a copy. Um, Wood, Wise, Saunders, and Doran wrote a monograph on a refined Behrman concept that is very illuminating, I think, to figuring how these people think and how they look at science and the whole role of their religious expectations and their view of science. I mean, these people are very sincere. They really do believe they are doing science. They're doing a little different science than what evolutionary biologists are doing. They recognize that, but they really believe that they are doing rigorous science. And they do have, um, they do have programs, um, uh, algorithms that they've written, and computer programs to do basically phonetic analyses of characteristics to try to determine the discontinuity systematics as opposed to the phylogenetic systematics. The idea is to come up with a definition of kind so that few enough kinds exist that you can get them all on the ark. But it is clear that preserving the literal truth of the Bible trumps everything else. In this passage from the book, they talk about the goals of uh, baromenology is to develop a new view of biology that is consistent with the biblical record. So there you have it. Uh, where your observations of the natural world conflict with the revealed truth of the Bible, the Bible wins. Um, some of you may have heard of Richard von Sternberg, who is a uh, biologist at the um, at NIH, actually. And he is a, um, a researcher. He has a, a, a visit, uh, I forget exactly what they call them, but he's a, you know, he has permission to use um, um, collections at the Smithsonian in Washington. He was involved in a kerfluffle a few years ago about uh, his editorship of a journal that came out of the Smithsonian called the uh, Proceedings of the Biological Society of Washington. He accepted a, a paper by Stephen Meyer, who's the director of the Intelligent Design Group, the Center for um, Science and Culture up in the Discovery Institute in Seattle. And uh, upon the publication of Steve Meyer's paper, all hell broke loose because the idea of publishing a, a paper on intelligent design in a referee journal uh, really was quite astonishing because this is not considered to be appropriate science. Richard von Sternberg is a baromenologist. He goes to baromenology conferences. He's very interested in discontinuity systematics. Uh, he's, he writes papers and publishes in their journal. This doesn't mean he's a young earth creationism. He denies that he's a young earther. But he certainly does hang out with an interesting crowd. 
In that same book that I showed you by Wood et al. is this passage, which I want to call your attention to, because it helps you understand what a Behrman is. Within the divinely established boundaries, variation can occur, but change beyond the boundaries might obscure the revelation. The biblical and theological evidence even provides a framework in which to search for these Behrmans. They should generally be equal or lower in rank than an order, but higher than a species. So here's, here's what we really see. We see the created kinds, and then we see diversification and variation within the kind. So is it a lawn or an orchard? It's hard, it's hard to tell, but it's not a tree in the sense of evolutionary biology looks at the relationships between organisms as tree. None of these come back together again at any place. These are all special creations, and then you have variations within the kind. Which gets back to what I was telling you before. They don't accept common ancestry, they don't expect the pattern, but natural selection is fine with them. Because natural selection just operates on the variation within the kind. It just operates to kind of swap around the genes and provide adaptations. Moths get darker, moths get lighter. Um, viruses become resistant, well, bacteria become resistant to antibiotics or plants become resistant to pesticides, no problem. But the bacteria doesn't become a giraffe. Okay? I mean, the, the idea that you have the created kinds and natural selection and adaptation can take place within the kinds, such as shown in that orchard. So the level that we're talking about here is something like a family level. They, that seems to be what they've settled upon as the most common example of a kind. So the felids would be a kind. The cat family would be a kind. And isn't that a fabulous picture, by the way? I stole it from a cat food uh, um, uh, advertisement. I, I, I'm also planning to use it to teach neoteny. Isn't that a great picture? <laughs> okay. So the cat kind, and by the way, in, in the Bible, uh, God said take male and female of each kind, but he said take seven pair of each clean kind. The clean kind are basically artiodactyls that you can eat, uh, and also fish, and I think there's something else that's clean, but um, whatever. Uh, uh, cats aren't clean. So there was only one pair of, of felid. When the ark landed and all the creatures got off the ark, the one pair of cats uh, then diversified into lions and tigers and pumas and bobcats and house cats and all the other kind of cats that we have. There is enough genetic variation within the felid kind, within the cat kind, to provide for all of this evolution, really. So these people are actually hyper-evolutionists in the sense that they believe within the kind you got evolution going like gangbusters. Uh, they have much, much faster uh, required rates of, of um, uh, mutation and recombination and natural selection to produce this huge wide variety of kinds. The dog kind is another kind. Wolves, jackals, coyotes, foxes, dogs, um, cape hunting dogs, so forth and so on. There's a general um, artiodactyl kind, the, um, uh, the cow sheep buffalo, um, which makes a lot of sense in a way because, you know, among artiodactyls, the, the bovids do form a definite clade, the ovids, the sheep, uh, form a clade. Antelopes are kind of a little further away. And one of the things that the baromenologists do is they take data that are um, collected, cytochrome B and various proteins and so forth, they take data on uh, these uh, various creatures that they're trying to classify, and they run it through these phonetic analyses and see how they cluster. And um, the, you know, some things are, are clearly going to cluster very well, some things are going to cluster not so well. But they're not terribly consistent because antelopes don't really cluster real closely with these other artiodactyls. In fact, the difference between, say, sheep and antelope is considerably further than the distance between this group of primates. Um, now, here we have chimps, gorillas, orangs, and humans. When you run the same sorts of algorithms on these four species, they cluster much more tightly than the cow sheep buffalo. Which means that either Noah and his family were Chimperella humitans, <laughs> and we are descend we and all the other apes are descended from 
from the people who came off the ark, which is probably not real likely. Um, or um, we are separate kinds, which is what the baromenologists would hold, or possibly baromenology is a really bad science. And I think probably that would, uh, you probably know where I stand on that. And in fact, uh, you can find if you uh, Google, we find all of our information through Google. If you Google baromenology, humans or something, you, you find papers where they've published these data. Of course, they're published in their own in-house journals. Um, but they publish these data and uh, you know, it, it doesn't work. Humans cluster with the apes and you cannot separate them out in the way that they do. But again, because the presupposition is that humans are a separately created kind from all the apes, humans have to be separate. Which of course throws sand in the gears of trying to determine any sort of consistent um, uh, percent difference or, or a similarity difference matrix between these various organisms because humans and apes are really close. And if they have to be separate, then a whole lot of other stuff has to be separate too. So the baromenologists, um, are not really doing actual research in the sense that, that it would be identifiable by, by anybody who is in the scientific community. They are manipulating the conclusions to accord with their own assumptions, which is hardly something that is scientifically defendable. But if they don't do very well with um, extant organisms, they do even more poorly when it comes to fossils. Finding discontinuities in the tree of life when you toss fossil evidence in with living uh, uh, with, with uh, genetic and other data from living forms really makes it impossible to make the kinds of separations that they want to make. Um, this is um, a chimpanzee. This is a modern human. Now, the purpose of this illustration is not to imply that we are descended from chimpanzees. That's not the point. Nor is it even to imply that the common ancestor of humans and chimps looked like a chimp, because we're pretty sure that it didn't. Chimps have evolved from that common ancestor just as we have evolved. But it's probably safe to imagine, uh, particularly since we do have some early human, early hominid fossils, that the earliest, um, that the common ancestor of chimps and, and humans did look somewhat ape-like. But so the, the modern day chimp here is not to imply that it looked exactly like modern day chimps, but you know, just to sort of give you an idea. Now these fossils, uh, B through K, are all arranged in order of approximate time, um, near, near as we can tell for dating. And it's a, it's a front shot and a side shot for each of these, as you can probably uh, recognize here. Here's the problem. Where do you draw the line? If, as the creationists believe, there's either apes or humans, there's no such thing as a transitional fossil, where would you draw the line? Could you draw a line and say, okay, on this side it's all apes, on this side it's all true humans? I think all of us would have a tough time. And of course, this is only a sample of the human fossil record. This is just some particularly nicely photographed <laughs> uh, pictures that we were able to put together. Oh, and by the way, the implication here is not that these are actual ancestors of humans. You know, this is not great, 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 great grandpa. This is great, 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 umpty ump, 172nd cousin. Uh, but these various cousins can tell us a lot about the hominids that lived at the same time that did, that were part of the human lineage. So this is why these fossils are very important. I would find it impossible, I think you would find it impossible, to draw a line and say everything on this side of the line is an ape, everything on the other side of the line is a human. And you know something? The creationists can't do it either. Here is a table <clears throat> of a series of uh, the, the uh, columns here are one, two, three, four, six creationist publications and how they classified each of these fossil humans. So good old 1813 was classified as just an ape by everybody. They were very consistent about that. Well, most people think 1813 is a habilis kind of creature. It's sort of an advanced Australopithecine, maybe an early erectus grade kind of varmint, one of these African um, um, erectus kind of creatures. Uh, the Java man, they also uh, didn't quite know what to do with that. This is classified by most of us as Homo erectus. Um, some of them thought it was an ape, some of them thought it was a human. 
it gets worse with the, um, the Peking fossil, another Homo erectus. Again, some of the creationists thought it was all apes, some of them thought it was all human. And when you get into something like 1470, which is considered, again, one of these very transitional kinds of fossils, they're split right down the line. Uh, they can't, when they're really confronted with an actual transitional fossil, with a fossil that exhibits transitional characteristics, they cannot distinguish between ape and human, which is exactly what we would assume as evolutionary biologists. Similarly, with uh, 3733, which is again one of these um, more advanced forms of, of, um, of hominid uh, erectus type, African erectus type, and the wonderful um, uh, boy from Ethiopia, um, <laughs> One of them doesn't want to see any humans at all, and you know that, that first column is, is all apes. But the point here is that creationists don't deal well with the fossil record. Uh, they don't deal well with living things because they have this presupposition that there are created kinds and there are no transitional fossils, there are no intermediates. And yet living things, because there can be no intermediates because there's no evolution, there is only special creation. And yet when you look at living things. When you, when you just look around the world at the creatures that we share the planet with today, we see a lot in biology that makes sense only if living things had common ancestors. Why is it that all the land vertebrates, sorry I left out the salamanders, you herps people will have to forgive me here, why is it that land vertebrates all have four legs? Snakes do too, they just lost them. Uh, birds have four legs, the, the wings are legs, y'all you know, you know that. Why is it that all land vertebrates have four legs? Well, creationists would say that God designed them that way because four legs is what's best for getting around on land. It was a functional design. And yet, that doesn't really make a whole lot of sense because there's a lot of ways of getting around on land. But the creationists really look at and this is where we get to the intelligent design argument as well. The creationists and the intelligent design people really do look at organisms as they would look at machines. And whereas if you had a bunch of nuts and bolts in your uh, workshop, you could put these together to make one kind of machine or another kind of machine. You have these, these parts that you can interact. Well, that's the way they look at something like the vertebrate arm. Or that's the way they would look at some of these other parts that could be mixed and matched to make an organism. They, they really do look at living organisms as if they were machines, as if they were purposeful arrangements of parts that were put together by an omniscient deity as we see them today. And this is true of the, of the intelligent design people as well as the creation science people. And yet, like I was saying, there's nothing special about having four limbs if you're a land animal. Insects are land animals. They get along just fine on six legs. Spiders have eight legs, millipedes have a whole bunch. Um, there's nothing magical about four limbs to uh, um, make a land um, um, animal. As a matter of fact, if God really had a sense of humor, he probably would have made land vertebrates with six legs, because wouldn't basketball be a whole lot more fun <laughs> if, you know, if we had two sets of, of forearms instead of, instead of only one? Um, but the reason why all land vertebrates have four limbs is because we evolved from an aquatic vertebrate that had to move around in two dimensions. Uh, they had to move up and down and back and forth in three dimensions, I guess, come to think of it. Um, aquatic vertebrates have a three-dimensional world that they have to navigate. And the minimal number of limbs that you need to navigate in a three-dimensional world is two in front and two in back. And we are descended from a creature that had that kind of structure for a very different environment than living on land. A very famous geneticist named Theodosius Dobzhansky wrote a book, uh, wrote an article for a science teacher journal called, uh, where, which he titled, Nothing in Biology Makes Sense Except in the Light of Evolution. And what he was talking about is why are things like the way they are instead of some other way? The reason why land vertebrates have four limbs is because they are descended from aquatic vertebrates that had four limbs. Not because there's some wonderful design about having four legs if you're a vertebrate. But perhaps the best rebuttal to the design argument is the existence of something called pseudogenes. 
And let me explain what a pseudogene is, because it's kind of an interesting thing. We're getting away from live bodies and, and fossils here. We're now getting into uh, to biochemistry. But the best way to understand pseudogenes, I think, is to think about plagiarism, uh, because they, it has some similarities. Now, let's say you have this fine book, um, uh, which I understand they'll be selling outside the door. When we, I, I didn't know that, or I would have put both of my books in the slide, but nonetheless. Let's say you have this fine book, and the first two sentences of this book are, in the United States, evolution became well accepted by the scientific community by the turn of the 20th century. It thereafter began to be included in sci college and secondary school textbooks. And let's say you're a teacher, and let's say a student submitted a paper which had that same sentence in it. Well, is this plagiarism? Maybe, but on the other hand, that's a pretty general thought you know, that was expressed in the first two sentences of that book. And quite possibly, if you're going to express that thought about evolution became well accepted, uh, began to be included in the school, you might use words that are just like that. I mean, that just might be the best way to express that idea. Just like the best way to express uh, a vertebrate on land is with four legs. You know, there just may be a, the best way of doing things, and that's why you did it that way. But what if, in this book, there was a mistake? And let's say that there was a typo in that, for which there is not. But let's say there's a typo in that first sentence that says, in the United States, evolution became well accepted by the scientific community. And let's say that your student handed in a paper that had that same mistake. How many of you would flunk the student? <laughs> yeah, this is plagiarism, right? This is plagiarism. It's plagiarism because that is a non-functional change. Okay? This is what pseudogenes are all about. Pseudogenes are screwed up genes. Here's hemoglobin. There's two chains of hemoglobin. There's an alpha globin and a beta globin. I'm going to call your attention to one of the genes in the beta chain called psi beta 1. Now, psi beta 1 is a really messy gene. Uh, we've expanded it here for you. This is actually a slide that was used by my friend Ken Miller in the Kitzmiller versus Dover trial. Uh, I am totally shameless when it comes to stealing good slides from friends. And I, it's the Groucho Marx school of plagiarism, steal only from the best. Right? Um, but here's what Psi Beta 1 looks like. Psi Beta 1 starts out with a altered initiator. It's got a bad start. It's got, um, gosh, I can hardly see this. It's got a frame shift, dele frame shift deletion. It's got stop codons where it shouldn't be. This gene isn't going to do diddly. It's just going to sit there in the beta chain and not do a thing. It is very, very screwed up, and it's not going to change. It, it's not going to function. It's not going to do anything. It is a pseudogene. It looks like a gene, but it's got so many mistakes in it that it doesn't work. So it's just sort of this inert gene. Interesting thing, all three of these primates <laughs> have this exact same error in their beta hemoglobin. Psi beta 1 looks like, has all these errors in chimps, in monkeys, in lemurs, and in human beings. Now, what is the explanation for this? Well, an evolutionary explanation is that all of these organisms inherited this pseudogene from a common ancestor. The creationist explanation for this would have to be God separately created a dysfunctional gene in humans, in monkeys, in apes, and in lemurs. Maybe he did, uh, but it's not the most parsimonious explanation. It makes much more sense, as, as Dobzhansky said, why are things like they are instead of some other way? Common ancestry makes biology make sense, and it makes human biology make sense. One of the very best bits of evidence for common ancestry of humans and apes comes from the study of chromosomes. Interesting thing here. See, I'm, I'm an equal opportunity abuser in my slides. I put my own picture in there, too. If you look at the chromosomes of orangs, chimps, gorillas, and humans, you find that chimps, gorillas, and orangs all have 48 chromosomes, 24 pairs. Humans have 46 chromosomes. We have one fewer chromosome than do the other great apes. This is kind of curious. What could explain this? Well, back in the 
1980s, uh, based on chromosome banding, a hypothesis was generated that human chromosome 2 might have been formed by a fusion of two chimp chromosomes, a translocation, if you will, where two chromosomes stuck together. Take a look at the banding patterns there of those two chimp chromosomes and of that one big human chromosome. This was a very plausible kind of hypothesis. It couldn't actually be tested until the Human Genome Project, when the Human Genome Project sequenced the whole human genome. But some hypotheses, who says evolution isn't an, isn't an experimental science, right? Sometimes you have to wait to be able to test your experiments, but, or test your theories, but it's definitely an experimental science. A hypothesis was made that if it was indeed the case that the chromosomes of the two chimpanzee chromosomes um, fused to form one big human chromosome, you would find some interesting characteristics of that fused chromosome. Number one, there are these little things at the ends of chromosome called telomeres, that's the blue jobbies in there. You would find telomeres in the middle because telomeres occur at the end of chromosomes, right? Those two chimp chromosomes came together, you get telomeres in the middle. You would also have to have two centromeres, that red spot there, which is the part of the chromosome that is extremely important in cell division. Um, that's where the chromosomes line up and they pair up and they split and all this kind of stuff. So um, you can't actually have two centromeres in a chromosome. So the prediction was that if the chimp chromosomes fused to form one big human chromosome, you would find telomeres in the wrong place, so to speak. You'd find telomeres in, in the middle someplace as well as at the ends, and you'd find a deactivated centromere. And sure shoot, and this is exactly what they found when they sequenced the human genome. During the formation of humus, human chromosome 2, one of the two centromeres became inactivated, which corresponds to the centromere from chimp chromosome 13, etc. And the, it says here, the centromeric structure quickly deteriorated. That is just so cool. I mean, that is just really a neat thing. This is another slide that I stole from Ken Miller. This is a great slide. Um, so between pseudogenes and the chromosomal material, there is lots and lots and lots of information suggesting that humans and apes shared a common ancestor. What did the, I'm sorry, that's out of, that slide is out of place, sorry. Um, what did the intelligent design folks say about these data on the, um, on the uh, chromosomal fusion? Uh, this is a uh, blogger, um, one of the intelligent design bloggers, a man named Casey Luskin from the Discovery Institute, attacked Ken Miller's testimony at Kitzmiller versus uh, Dover. Um, I would only just suggest that you have to read this for yourself. It is so full of just basic misunderstandings of basic biology that it, it isn't funny. Uh, just let one example uh, suffice. He claimed that if there was a translocation of that sort, that the animal, the, the organism would not be able to reproduce, that any gametes that would be produced having a translocation like this would, would not be able to be, uh, to, to fertilize uh, an egg or be fertilized if it happened in a female, and that this would just be the end of the line. Well, that's absolute nonsense because we have plenty of examples. We, we observe things like that happening, happening in extant creatures. Um, you've got all the chromosomal material. It's just in a funny place. So the chromosomes can line up. They just line up in a kind of cockeyed way, that's all. And we do see um, cases uh, in extant organisms where we can see those kinds of translocations uh, having occurred. And eventually, two individuals with a translocated chromosome would mate, and you know, just through recombination would, would reconstitute that new double uh, uh, chromosome, one fewer pairs than the ape groups. Um, another mistake that Luskin makes in this article is to claim that uh, organisms with, or species with two different uh, uh, numbers of chromosomes couldn't possibly mate. And uh, that's just empirically wrong too. We have 
horses with 64 chromosomes, uh, Schwalski's horse with 66 chromosomes. They can mate, they can produce viable fertile offspring, they can produce hybrids, there's no problem. Uh, different numbers of chromosomes is not as important as what is the actual genetic material. And the actual genetic material of these two equids matches up just fine, even though the packages are divided up slightly differently. So creationists excel in misunderstanding science, misunderstanding its conclusions, and generally getting the story wrong. And they are particularly sensitive when it comes to human evolution because, of course, it is human evolution that is the most sensitive. And they work extremely hard to try to keep the humans as a separately created kind that is completely unrelated to other forms. And yet, what a shame, because this whole story of the history of life is, su is such a fascinating one. And, and it's, it's too bad that they can't really understand this. Um, here we are. We are primates. Human beings are one of many, many different kinds of mammals. Here we are, one of, of many, many different kinds of mammals. We are also amniotes. We are creatures like um, birds and like uh, reptiles that have an amniotic egg that allowed our ancestors to invade the land and not be tied to the water for reproduction. We also are tetrapods. We are four-legged land vertebrates uh, like these other groups like um, amphibians, like um, um, reptiles, uh, uh, birds and mammals. Um, we had a common ancestor with all of these other groups that was a tetrapod. This whole idea of common ancestry is such a fascin fascinating way of looking at our relationship to the whole rest of, dare I say, creation. Of our relationship to the whole rest of this fabulous tree of life that has branched and split through time. Way up here, we find another kind of evolutionary development, shall we say, a, a very basic one that, that you would not think would be especially important. But humans belong to a lineage called deuterostomes where very early in embryological development of each one of us and of starfish and of, of um, bony fish and of amphibians and reptiles and birds and mammals, all of the animals downstream from this point here, all of these deuterostomes, in all of us during our embryo embryological development, we have a ball of cells which forms this little invagination called a blastopore. In our lineage, that blastopore becomes the anus. In the arthropods and their relatives, it becomes the mouth. So what's with that? How come this makes this huge, huge difference? Well, it does. Every creature that's sort of on our side of this divide has this very small but very basic relationship. Why are things the way they are instead of some other way? Because we shared a common ancestor that had this characteristic way back in time with all of these other forms. We shared this common ancestor with these other forms. Even more, further back in time in, in, from the deuterostome, um, um, a protostome split, we find the evolution, as it were, of bilateral symmetry. So all of the creatures from this node on, including a lot of invertebrates, have the right side the same as the left side, bilaterally, bilaterally symmetrical. We sort of take that for granted, but it's a huge evolutionary development. It allows for a tremendous amount of flexibility for adaptations and, and radiations into a lot of different uh, life forms. We are bilaterally symmetrical, and all of the other creatures from this node on down are bilaterally symmetrical because we are descended from an ancestor that was bilaterally symmetrical. That's the way evolution works. We are multiple celled organisms, like plants and all of the rest of the animals. We are metazoa. Because we, are, we and plants are descended from an early metazoan form. And we have nucleated cells. We are eukaryotes. Our hereditary material is enclosed in a membrane within each cell in our body. So is every other animal from that point down on this chart. I mean, that is just a mind-boggling thought to me. And ultimately, we get back to the very first forms of life, the first unicellular forms of life. They have DNA or RNA. 
and every living thing on the planet has DNA or RNA. Evolution makes biology make sense. It tells you why things are the way they were, why things are the way they are rather than some other way. All living things have DNA because all living things are descended with modification from an earlier ancestor with DNA. All human beings are primates because we are descended, excuse me, um, all of us primates are mammals because we and other mammals are descended from a common early mammal ancestor. And what a fascinating, what a fascinating tale this is. We are part of a huge, huge web of living things arranged in this hierarchical branching and splitting pattern. And studying this and learning about it has been truly one of the great intellectual achievements of the 19th, 20th, and 21st century. And isn't it sad that so many kids around this country are not being allowed to learn this? Because in their schools, teachers don't want to teach evolution because it's too controversial. Or worse, in many respects, they teach evolution as if it were weak science, as if it were wrong, as if its conclusions were flawed and faulty, as if it were a theory in crisis, as the creationists say it. How sad that students are not being able to learn this wonderful, fascinating science. If you want to know more about that aspect, about the people who don't want evolution to be taught, go to our website, which is ncseweb.org. And if you go to the press room button up there on top, you will go to this page where you can get really depressed. Uh, you can search by year and find out all of the things that are going on in the creation and evolution controversy in past years. Or you can go down and search for New York or Pennsylvania or any other state that you're interested in. You can also go to the resources pages or any of these other buttons and get a whole lot more information on creation and evolution. And you can also join, which would be fine too. But you really, I really have to thank the Ellis B. Leakey Foundation for the opportunity to talk with you today about human evolution and about creationism and about this fascinating field of evolution that has been something that I've been passionate about since literally seventh grade. Uh, that's when I first learned about evolution. But I had to learn about it on my own because my teacher wasn't teaching it. I found it in the in the, in the library, in a college textbook that I didn't understand, but it looked so fascinating. So I decided I wanted to become an anthropologist. The Leakey Foundation supports the kind of research in paleontology, in primatology, that helps to explain a lot of the things that I was talking about tonight, and helps us to have a richer, fuller picture of this wonderful science of evolution. And I thank them very much for including me in their family uh, this evening and letting me come and, and appear at this wonderful museum, which teaches evolution in every pore, that, that in every hallway that you can go down here. This is, a, this is a great place. So you ought to join the Leakey Foundation. And if you, know, if you are not busy, you can join us too. Thank you so much for coming out to hear me tonight. <laughs>